Okay, so Hobbes' Leviathan, uh, we start with the lead letter dedicatory that he wrote to uh, Francis Godolphin. Uh, and basically Hobbes sort of writes this to a uh, sponsor or a potential sponsor and basically is saying, uh, he admits that this might be controversial, and he sort of says, well, I'm, I'm dedicating this book to you because your brother was good to me, I hope you'll be good to me. He says at the end, you can kind of reject it if you want, you can say that I'm, you know, I, I love my own opinion too much, and that I presumed on your friendship and so on, and you don't actually agree with this. So he, he admits, or he sort of acknowledges or realizes up front that this will be a very controversial book. And why will it be controversial? He says, on the one hand, he's sort of trying to pass between two enemy, ca enemy camps, one side contending for too much liberty, too much freedom for people, and the other people, and, and the other side contending for too much power for the government. Uh, so we'll see what that means as it plays out. I mean, the short answer is Hobbes thinks that the government should have a lot of power, but the the legitimacy of the government should ultimately be based uh, not on the not on not on the uh, claims that the uh, sovereign has to be descended from the right uh, ancestor or even to be ruling based on the will of God, but on the consent of the people. So he wants a lot of power for the government, but the legitimacy of the government ultimately rests on the consent of the, of the governed. Uh, and we'll see he limits, you know, that's, it's, it's no, that, that's nowhere near as uh, far-reaching or dynamic uh, an idea as it will be developed later by Locke and, of course, Thomas Jefferson and so on. Uh, but, you know, Locke or, or Hobbes sort of sets forth in, in this book, he sort of says uh, a new basis for... Uh, for uh, for political legitimacy, again, the ultimately the consent of the governed, the the protection of the rights of the governed. Uh, so he says, you know, I'm, I'm sort of th there. There are two sides. One wants what I think is too much freedom. One want the other side wants what I think is too much uh, power for the government. I'm trying to pass between them. Inevitably, I'll, I'll I'll make some enemies. I'll upset people. He says, but you know, people shouldn't criticize if I'm actually trying to support the uh, the power of the, of the of the civil power. And he says he is, and he compares himself to these uh, simple and, and unpartial uh, creatures in the Roman capital. And what he's referring referring to there is a story about uh, when, when the, the, the Romans were in the capital deliberating about something and there were enemies sneaking up on them and geese outside the capital started to make noise because it was, you know, geese were, were they, they were scared. They started to make noise. The Romans inside of the capital realized someone must be out there. The geese just don't start doing that for no reason. So they got their weapons. They were able to fight off these attackers. And Hobbes says, you know, th it's not that the geese were loyal to the Romans. They weren't dogs. It's, it's not that they were there loyal to the Romans inside the capital trying to fend off uh, outsiders. They weren't loyal to the individuals in the capital. They just made noise and therefore, you know, saved them. Uh, just just by, by helping them, again, not because they were actually loyal to these particular rulers or these particular people in this particular building, but simply because they made noise and therefore helped whoever was in the capital to know what was outside. And Hobbes says he's the same way. He's not arguing for a particular ruler, for particular personalities or individuals or anything. He's arguing for the civil power generally. He's arguing for the importance of proper government and therefore arguing that, that the civil power should have a certain independence and, and, and a certain power of its own, not because he's supporting this or that monarch or this or that individual, but because he's making a general argument about, about how power should be understood and, and, and how uh, govern, governments uh, should rule. And again, as he goes on to say, basically, uh, he, then he goes on, he says, you know, what, what, what will most uh, uh, sort of... Uh, be most controversial is, he says, the, 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 uh, the sort of unusual or, or the heterodox use that I make of certain passages of Scripture. He says, I, I, I refer to Scripture, I, I sort of base part of my argument on it, or I at least say that my argument is in line with Scripture, but the, the interpretation, the understanding of the Bible that I offer when I do this is unusual. It's heterodox. It's, it's not the, the common or orthodox understanding. He says, of course, that will be controversial. He says, but I've done it, you know, with, with, with due deference and so on, but he says, more than anything, I've done it because these are the outworks of the enemy. So clearly he says there's an enemy there, and the enemy has, you know, uh, sort of outworks, uh, sort of siege works, and, and, and uh, a fortress and so on, and the outworks, the, 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 the outer things that they use to attack or, or to defend themselves are, are passages of Scripture, understanding of the Bible. And Hobbes says, so I have to challenge them on this basis. Uh, as, as he puts it, you know, the, these, these particular uh, uh, passages and the way that they're used uh, are, as he puts it, outworks of the enemies of the enemy from whence they impugn the civil power. So again, he says, the, the enemy here that I'm identifying are people who try to impugn or, or you know, uh, downplay or, or, or degrade or some way or another attack the civil power. Uh, and he sort of makes this distinction here between the civil power and the religious or, or ecclesiastical power. So he sort of says, you know, my enemy here are the people who are trying to uh, uh, put down the, the, the civil power, saying that the civil power should not have as much power uh, as, as I think it should, especially compared to, the, to religious or ecclesiastical power. He says, this is the enemy, this is who I'm arguing against, and therefore I have to engage with them on their own grounds, deal with their outworks, as he puts it, scripture and their understanding of scripture. So he identifies here, he makes this very, again, sort of uh, 
classic um, uh, enlightenment distinction between civil power, which is basically secular, religious power, which is the church, and so on. And he, ar he argues throughout here in this uh, letter dedicatory that what he's trying to do is support the civil power. And that, that may lead him into certain controversies, but that's necessary in order to support the civil power, especially against its enemies and therefore his enemies. Again, he says he's, he's defending the civil power as such, the civil power simply. Uh, and therefore, the enemies of the civil power are his, are his enemies, and these enemies who basically are sort of using scripture to, to, to attack or to uh, try to minimize the authority and, and, and importance of the civil power, he says, therefore, I have to go against them. Uh, so, you know, the letter dedicatory, he sets himself up as, as, as uh, arguing in favor of the, of, of, uh, of the civil power, of the civil kind of secular government against uh, those who try, to, uh, who try to attack it, who try to uh, make, make trouble for it. Then in, in the introduction, he begins, and uh, very quickly we see this, uh, well, we'll just read, the, the introduction begins. Hobbes says, Nature, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, is by the art of man, as in many other things, so in this also imitated that it can make an artificial animal. So first of all, he says, you know, nature, and he identifies that as the art whereby God hath made and governs the world. So he says, you know, how did God make the world? How does God govern the world? Through nature. So the first thing that that does is, is in many ways sort of demystify God. Nature obviously can be studied by science. It can be understood by human reason. And if that's the art by which God has made and then governs the world, what Hobbes is saying, God isn't mysterious. We can basically understand what God has done and, and how he rules the world and so on by, uh, by studying nature. Now, in different parts of the Leviathan, he says, of course, God can make miracles and so on. But the way he suggests it here, it's almost kind of a deist conception of God. God made the world using, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, God made the world using nature. He governs the world through nature. We can understand that. It's a very regular, uh, rational governance of the world, which we can understand using reason. And then Hobbes goes further and says, we can also imitate this art. We can also imitate nature. And he says, we can, we can construct a kind of artificial being, a kind of artificial uh, life. And then this is, and so he says, you know, God rules the world through nature. We can understand it. And not only understand it, we can imitate it. And we can sort of build our own, our, our own, uh, our own artificial objects, which are themselves uh, basically, he says, endowed with life. He goes on, and so what does he mean by that? How, how can we make an artificial life? What does he mean? So he goes on and he says, or an artificial animal, as he puts it. He goes on, he says, For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within, why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels as, as doth a watch, have an artificial life? So, uh, seeing life is but a motion of limbs. So here this is, we have this kind of uh, materialist conception of life, including human life. Hobbes says, what is life? It's just a motion of limbs. It's just matter in motion. Uh, he says, therefore, a watch, which basically you wind up and it runs, it, it eventually runs out just like every other kind of life. He says, a watch is basically an artificial life. He says, all automata, all things, all, all, all machines that are built and operate according to their own uh, sort of inner power, their own, their own inner working. So, you know, a, a pen isn't, isn't really a life because it needs someone else to move it. But things like a watch, which you can wind up and then run on their own, he says, that's, that's like life. Because what is, what is life in general? Just limbs in motion, including human life. So he says, you know, human beings basically are just sort of more complicated machines, like watches. We are also matter in motion. All of our perceptions of the world have to do with the way that, that, the, that the physical reality of the world acts on our physical bodies. And then our ideas come from these physical, physical perceptions and, and sensations and so on, as he'll say in those, those first chapters of the Leviathan. So he says, you know, life is ultimately just matter in motion, limbs in motion, and therefore you can create an artificial life in the form of a watch or any other machine that simply runs on its own. He says it's the same thing. It's matter in motion. It's obviously simpler, but it's the same basic thing. Now, obviously, you may not agree with that. You may say, but people are more complicated than, uh, than, than machines, than watches, even more complicated machines. Uh, the mind, the soul, these things can't be reduced to, to, to simple you know, uh, matter in motion, to the, the product of, of uh, a motion of limbs or, or material forces that are, that are interacting with each other. You can disagree with all of that, but that's what Hobbes is saying here. Uh, uh, you know, life is just matter in motion, limbs in motion, and therefore we can create artificial life. Uh, in terms of automata, but he also says we can also create a commonwealth. That, he says, is also an artificial form of life. Uh, he says basically government. That is, that is an artificial form of life in which we're basically imitating man. Uh, he says, you know, um, he says we're, it's basically sort of a, a, an artificial, uh, um, as he says, art goes yet further, imitating that rational and most excellent work of nature, man. Now here God has dropped out. It's just nature that, that uh, uh, produces man. Of course, you might say, well, but 
it's still implied, but in any case, he doesn't mention God here. He goes, comes back to that at the, at the end and sort of comes back. But here he says that rational, most excellent work of nature, man. So he says, you know, man is created uh, by nature. And he says, and human beings can sort of uh, imitate that as well and create a commonwealth, which is like an artificial man. So he says, for by art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state, which is but an artificial man. So Hobbes really kind of piling up the, uh, the uh, comparisons here. It's a leviathan. Uh, it's also a man. Uh, he, he himself is often very critical of, of, of figurative speech and so on, but he really goes in for it here. Uh, so he says, first of all, by art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth. Now, where does, where is the term, what is a leviathan? Where does that come from? It comes from the Bible, from the book of Job, when Job finally loses his patience and is sort of critical of God and says, you know, why are you doing this to me? What, this isn't fair and so on. One of the things that God comes back and answers him is, you know, were you there when, when, I, when I created the, uh, the world? Can, have, have you seen, can you create the, the Leviathan, the great beast of the sea, or the behemoth, the great beast of the land? Hobbes also wrote a, a later book called Behemoth. Uh, so basically God, one of his justifications or at least responses to Job is to say I created the the Leviathan you can't challenge me because I'm I'm sort of greater than you I mean you can see in a very cynical way that it's just sort of God saying I'm doing this because I can and I'm more powerful therefore you know you can't really say anything uh, a more pious interpretation might be that he's saying look you can't understand things are mysterious and and a symbol of that is that I created the the Leviathan which which is so great that, that it's something that you can't understand you couldn't do and therefore you know you can't understand me so obviously Hobbes is saying here, yes, we can. We can create a Leviathan. We can imitate not just, you know, not just nature in general and not just uh, uh, the, you know, the creation of different types of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, matter and motion, different animal life, different, different forms of life. But he says in particular that thing that God used as justification for why human beings couldn't question God, we can create that. We, we, can, we can basically rival God. We can create that thing that God used as, as his justification for why Job couldn't criticize him or couldn't question him. So Hobbes says, you know, human beings can make, the, the can and, and do make that, that, that Leviathan. He says uh, uh, political life, government is, is a kind of Leviathan. We, we, we can create that thing that God created. We can imitate his art in a way that, again, makes us sort of rivals of God, makes us able to sort of criticize uh, the way that the world actually is, in particular, you know, human suffering, divine indifference to human suffering. We can, we can change that. We can, we can imitate that and make it better and sort of fix nature in a sense. Uh, as, as we'll see when he talks about the state of nature, it's not a good place for human beings. So we don't just imitate nature. In imitating it, we really correct it. The, the things that we build, especially government, the commonwealth, we're not just imitating nature for the sake of imitating it. We're actually sort of correcting nature. Uh, but the other thing that this has in common uh, with, with, the, with the biblical example of the Leviathan, Hobbes very concerned, like God was when he talks about the Leviathan, with humbling human pride. Uh, one of the great themes of the Leviathan is how proud people are, how vainglorious they are, to use the word that Hobbes prefers, and how damaging and destructive that is for everyone. Uh, so so there, there's also that, that, that sort of uh, uh, resonance that it has there that Hobbes is also, you know, we can rival God and imitate God and, and sort of, you know, uh, go ahead and, and, and create and, and correct these problems that we see with the divine creation because we actually can make a Leviathan of our own. But we should also keep in mind that in doing that, one of the things we need to do is, is humble human pride. Uh, make people less less vainglorious and therefore less destructive. Uh, so he says that, and then, then he goes on. So he says, you know, that, that again, that the uh, the Commonwealth is a sort of uh, uh, artificial man, and he, he gives this this long uh, uh, comparison of different parts of the Commonwealth with with different parts of the human body. Uh, he says, you know, again, that the Commonwealth is created by art, not by nature. So against uh, Aquinas, against Aristotle, against this long tradition that says that, that political life is natural. Hobbes says that, no, it's actually created by art. It's actually artificial. It's created by human contrivance. It's not something that just arises from nature. We, again, imitate nature to create it, but we do have to, we do have to sort of step in and, and actually do something. It's not simply a matter of natural impulse. Uh, so he concludes, lastly, the pacts and covenants by which the parts of this body politics were at first made, set together, and united, resemble that fiat, or the, or the let us make man, pronounced by God in the creation. So here again, sort of saying, when we create uh, this, this body politic, this political body of, of the Leviathan, of the commonwealth, we are like God creating man. And again, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, kind of... You could argue it's blasphemous. It certainly doesn't seem overly pious to be sort of comparing uh, our, our creation to be comparing human creation to divine creation of the human. Uh, you can, again, you can see why people were sort of very suspicious of Hobbes on, on religious grounds and so on. But he says, you know, 
that's that we can make this this artificial life, this commonwealth, uh, and when we do, when we finally make it through uh, pacts and covenants, it's it's again, it's it's like when God says, "Let us make man." We are ourselves the creators. And again, notice that He says it's the pacts and covenants which bring this into existence, not uh, pacts and covenants between consenting uh, sort of contracting individuals. Hobbes, of course, one of the fir the first person to really uh, set forth the uh, the uh, idea of the social contract. Uh, and so basically, you know, sort of saying again, it doesn't come from the, the proper uh, heredity of the king or, or a grant from God. It comes from pacts and covenants created by, by individual human beings and entered into by them. Uh, and then he goes on in, in the second part of the uh, introduction. He basically uh, talks about, you know, sort of what, what the, the, the overall purpose of the book lays out the... Uh, the uh, plan for the book, and, and then talks about basically the importance of understanding human beings, especially for a sovereign. Uh, and he, he gives a couple of different uh, famous sayings. Uh, uh, he says the first one. He says the first one is. Uh, uh, he says it's been you know uh, uh, the idea that wisdom is acquired not by reading of books but of men. Uh, he goes on. He says. Uh, Consequently, whereunto those persons that for the most part can give no other proof of being wise take great delight to show what they think they have read in men by uncharitable censures of one another behind their backs. This might seem like a very kind of trivial, and why is Hobbes talking about people being critical of one another behind their back? It's actually an idea that comes up in, in some of his other books. It seems to have been for him uh, somehow very kind of emblematic of, of, of human beings, uh, human pride, but also this desire to find fault with other people and so on. But he says, you know, this is what some people think that that means is, what does it mean to understand people? It means to be able to criticize them, but not when they're around, uh, so you can sort of really just say whatever you want. Uh, but he says, but even more important, he says, is, is the idea of, you know, read thyself, know thyself. And he says that doesn't mean you get to be saucy, and it doesn't mean that, that you know people in power can just do whatever they want. He says it means you know you have to understand to other to understand other people. You have to understand yourself. He says the passions are the same in everyone. The objects of the passion differ greatly. So what one person desires is not the same as what the other person desires. What one person fears is not what the other person fears. But the basic uh, uh, passions of desire and fear are the same in everybody. He says it's confusing because the objects are different, but the basic human passions involved are the same for everyone. So he says if you can understand that, if you can understand people uh, by understanding human nature, then, then if you can understand yourself, then you can understand human nature. But he says that's also kind of limiting. Most people, all they can really see up close is themselves and, and the people around them. So Hobbes says, I've written this book, I've laid out what human nature is really like. Now all that the reader, a sovereign in particular, has to do is read the book and compare it to himself, and then it's like he's got this great, huge, you know, sample, so to, you know, like, so to speak, like we might say today, you know, polling sample or something. He's got this huge sample that Hobbes has distilled into this one book, all of this experience, all of this study, and then he can just compare it to himself, and it will be a very quick and easy way to understand human nature and to understand whether or not Hobbes is right. Uh, so, you know, that's how he sort of ends. He says, you know, this, this book is, is, enabled, is, is designed to enable uh, the sovereign to understand human beings better and more quickly. Uh, and, and sort of because Hobbes says, I've been studying people. I've, I've observed all kinds of people. I've come to understand what human nature is. I've compared it to myself. I've written it down here. And he says, and ultimately, the, the ultimate uh, criteria for whether or not this is accurate is for the reader to compare what he sees here to himself and say, uh, is this accurate? Is this what people are really like?